Welcome to After the Oil Machine. The issues raised in the film, The Oil Machine, have become even more urgent in recent months with dramatic upheavals in energy security, the cost of living, and our climate. We're now going back to the film's contributors to ask them how recent global events have shaped the ongoing debate about oil. I'm Rachel Kaplan, Outreach Coordinator for the film, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Dylan Hamilton. Dylan is a climate justice activist who began striking from school for the climate in early 2019. Through his work with Fridays for Future Scotland, he has helped with organising the largest climate protests in the country's history, amassing over 40,000 demonstrators. So thanks for joining us here today. Dylan, we just had our oil machine broadcast on BBC Scotland last night, and we had some terrific response to the film on Twitter. But also I was going to start with this um, other comment we had, which says, the oil machine on BBC Scotland, absolutely scary. Absolutely scary how indoctrinated our children have been with climate scare fallacies. Uh, Dylan, you must hear things like this uh, often in the work that you're doing. And do you feel that um, young people are being indoctrinated with information on climate? Uh, I definitely don't. I mean, if anything, it's the opposite. We're not really talking about it enough, given the severity of it. I mean, I suppose they see the kind of fear young people are facing and they don't think it's a legitimate fear. So then they get angry that young people are scared. But fear is definitely the logical response when you fully understand the crisis. I mean, I definitely don't think I'm indoctrinated. I mean, I'm studying it at university level, and for it to be indoctrination, there would have to be some like big global conspiracy that every scientist is in on and every government is in on. And I feel like we all know that's not really very feasible. Um, so, I mean, it's just irrelevant at this point to try and deny climate science. It's the same level as flat Earth. So you have been striking on Fridays for a number of years. When you started, what was your experience of climate education in schools? And in that time you've been striking, has anything changed or improved? I never really got climate education at school. I mean, we did the basics, I guess, when I was 10, you know, ice is melting and polar bear populations are declining. And then that was kind of it. You kind of just get sent out to play and it's never really talked about seriously. Um, I definitely think when you get to secondary school, there's a huge lack considering that's when you really should be starting to shape your thoughts of the world. Um, I didn't take geography in higher levels, but I know that like higher textbooks even considered the benefits of climate change, which for me is a very weird perspective to try and have. <laughs> but I don't know. I think even the minimal climate education we do have is nowhere near enough because climate change is such a kind of overarching issue it's in literally every subject you can put it in um, so yeah it's definitely not enough at all have you been in touch with our leaders in government about this and have you had any response uh so a while ago i did some work with a campaign called teach the future and the idea is pretty straightforward the future need to be taught about what's actually going to happen and how society is going to look um, and they've done a lot of good stuff. I haven't been involved in a while, of course, with them, as I said. But I think in England they passed, like a, or they're proposing a climate education bill, which kind of, instead of having climate education as just something you talk about within geography or specifically within environmental science topics, it's more encompassing and you talk about it in all different sorts of uh, situations. And that's a really good thing. Um, I think it definitely needs to be talked about a lot more in schools. So what do you see is ahead for Fridays for Future then? Are the Friday strikes going to continue? I think we'll just continue with whatever we think is doing it something. It's not really a situation where we can win or lose. We kind of just have to keep trying all the time. Um, and I think that's kind of where most of us will be. It's such a terrifying prospect of failing, I suppose. So we can't really stop. So we'll just continue to get angry and strikes are a really good way of doing that. Um, but they're also not necessarily just a protest. I find them really, really useful for kind of coping with my own fear of the climate crisis because you're with all these people who share the same experiences and share the same anger. It's just nice to be around. Um, and then of course we have our large demonstrations where people can come who obviously wouldn't be able to strike every week. 
um, everybody can get really angry. We can also learn uh, and put pressure on people in power. So we'll definitely be continuing doing that. And one step uh, on from strikes, we're also seeing a wave of direct actions recently, Just Stop Oil and others, often targeting the infrastructure of the oil machine. Do you think this is a way to win over public opinion? Uh, I mean, there's lots of different targets, I think. There's so many things you can target with climate things. You can aim for public opinion, which is what I would say our protests aim for. They kind of aim for general support of a, here's what the majority want, do it. Um, and then there's other protests that might target specific fossil fuel industry in a, no, we're drawing a line here, you are not doing this. And I think both are incredibly valuable. Uh, I like to talk about the kind of diversity of tactics. You need a huge range of people who can do so many different things. You need environmental NGOs who know how to talk policy, who know how to talk to MPs, MSPs, and you need people all the way on the other end of that scale who are willing to go to jail over this. Um, and personally, I haven't really done direct action yet. I don't think it's something I'm willing to put myself in that position of right now, but I deeply respect those who do. Um, and I do think, especially with what we're facing, it does make a lot of sense to kind of just draw a red line and say, no, you're not producing this oil. You're not having this coal mine and just physically not let it happen. Um, because if we don't, who will? So if a young person somewhere in the country uh, right now is watching this and thinking about getting involved and what they can do, where, where, where should they start? Where's a good place to get going? Um, I mean, again, there's such a variety of people, a variety of skills. So it really depends on the person. Um, I think, obviously, become an activist, but that's such a broad term. Um, learn about it, read about it. It depends on your situation, it depends where you live, it depends what the activist scene already looks like, um, where you live. But there will be something in your area, you just have to find it. So kind of scroll through Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, try and find the group in your area. It might be Fridays for Future, it might be Extinction Rebellion, it might be a totally different group that I've never heard of. Um, it kind of varies a lot between different cities, but just look for like-minded people. Make sure you're keeping up to date with the science and the kind of general gist of the conversation and yeah, just see what you can do. So in addition to climate activism, you also campaign very actively for trans rights. And how do you see connections between trans liberation and fights for climate justice? Um, so as a climate activist, I'm motivated by kind of people and um, the idea that millions, if not billions of people are gonna suffer is just horrifying to me. So I'm coming at it from a very kind of human rights justice perspective. And some people kind of start from a different perspective and eventually reach the climate justice perspective, but it's kind of the key driver for me. So when I'm thinking of human rights, everything has to come into that. You can't just pick one human right. You can't say, oh, I support women's rights, but I actually like racism. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Um, so I think it's really, really important to be intersectional in everything I do. And obviously trans rights is particularly personal to me just because I am trans. I never intended to do any kind of trans rights organizing. It's more in a response to the kind of active hate campaign and the amount of people who just straight up don't want me to exist. <laughs> and so it's kind of a response to that rather than something I set out to do. But I think it does come into the more general thing of marginalized identities are much more likely to be affected by the climate crisis. And obviously it depends on the identity, but for example, LGBT people are much more likely to live in poverty. And obviously as the climate crisis gets worse, those in poverty will suffer the most and more likely to live close to polluting power stations or just polluting environments in general. And of course, that's the same for um, people of color and all different varieties of marginalized identities. In the film where Sir David King speaks about the urgent need for action within the next five years, and you were talking, Dylan, um, about putting using protests as a way to put pressure on governments. So do you see that change still is to be led by governments? Uh, what should the priorities be for government within the next five years? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, I think it varies in every single country. It's a different situation. I think it'd be naive to rely on governments right now. I think 
one of the most important things going forward is going to be community and supporting each other and physically drawing red lines as you know the population um, in our best interests because currently I don't think the government does have humanity's best interests at heart I think they have their own best interests at heart and that is continuing profit and continuing the status quo that props up their lavish lives and I mean if they were going to take it seriously that would be excellent you know there's loads of places we could start we could start on you know physically dismantling the oil industry but also ensuring a just transition at the same time and um, mm-hmm. we could start on making sure houses are properly insulated so they don't need as much energy in the first place uh, improving public transport so many things and um, but the will has to be there first and right now i don't think the will is there but it doesn't mean there aren't improvements we can make because if the population don't want to continue to use kind of dirty polluting things then naturally things are going to change they're going to go out of style i suppose um, and that is an important factor as well but right now i don't see politicians leading any sort of change there is the fact that young people in school strike as many of them don't vote so do you feel that that's an additional hurdle to overcome when trying to get government to listen uh i definitely think the age thing can be an issue and um, obviously my like goals for the country are going to be different to somebody who's pensioner. We have very different lives. We interact with the world very differently. And I think it can be a concern when some people don't need to care about climate change because they're not going to be here when the effects are really felt. But when you're young, it can be kind of all encompassing because you read constantly about how bad things are now. How bad could they get when I'm like only 40? Um, So that could definitely be a factor. But Still, as I say, most of the voting age population want more to be done on climate change. So there really is that backing. And that's for the whole UK rather than just Scotland, where it's even higher. Um, so I do think politicians are a little bit out of touch with the people when it comes to that. As you say, that, that there's a lot of anxiety in young people at the, at the moment about the climate. But also, what gives you um, hope? What inspires you when you are meeting with other young people? Uh, hope is a very difficult concept <laughs> in this kind of activism. I deliberately try not to think about it because we kind of have two choices with this. We can do something or you can do nothing. And obviously I have to do something, even if it feels futile something. Sometimes I have to do it because the alternative is just not fathomable. I can't just do nothing. And that would be so much worse. I would feel horrible. So that is one of the ways I combat the negative feelings is do something because then at least, you know, I can look myself in the eye. But I suppose there is lots of hope as well. I find the more I know about climate change specifically and about the whole everything around it, people doing something about it, even bad guys and oil companies and everything, the more I know about it, the more that almost helps, because I suppose there's a concept of understanding your enemy, but also seeing the activists who are doing things all over the world who have been doing so for decades since before I was born, was born protecting their environment and their right of life, uh, particularly in indigenous communities, it's, it can be really inspiring. On the one hand, the UK government has made significant pledges as part of the Paris Agreement to limit global warming within one and a half to two degrees. And on the other hand, the government is also issuing over 100 new North Sea oil and gas licenses. I think we have to kind of look at pledges historically as well. I mean, pledges have been made for decades and there's never really accountability. We often pledge a certain sum of money to a certain thing or a certain level of support to a certain country. And quite often there's never accountability for it um, because it doesn't fit news cycle. The announcement gets the news cycle, but the follow up's never going to make the news cycle if it it actually happened. Um, And I think that's particularly relevant to climate change, particularly when it comes to like loss and damages, for example, with Global North countries pledge so and so amount and it never necessarily gets seen. And we're still working on pledges we made years ago that were supposed to be done by now. Um, and that's definitely very relevant. Um, it shows where the actual priorities are. They'll say what looks good, but they'll do what they actually prioritise, which is still making money. So you mentioned their accountability. Do what obligation should a country like the UK have to other countries when it comes to climate? We are historically one of the highest emitters in the world, which means we 
hold a lot of responsibility for this. And especially since a lot of what drives the climate crisis is overconsumption um, and exploitation of the global south, which we have done for centuries. It's pretty much rooted in this idea that the earth is just a resource and we can extract as much as we want and it'll never have an impact the other way. And that is an idea that we as a country and other kind of colonizing countries spread around the world. And now we extract from these global south countries and we extract, extract from the North Sea. It's kind of the same concept in a way. So we definitely have a responsibility when it comes to the issue. But then we also have to factor in that we're not going to be as hard hit. Unfortunately, the people who contribute the least will be hurt the most. So we have a responsibility to give losses and damage funding to countries that are already seeing impacts from the climate crisis to kind of help them manage and deal with those effects. Do you think COP conferences are an effective way for countries, for us to make global agreements and make change? Um, Yes and no. I think COP has its benefits. I also think it has its downfalls. I think it's very important for countries to come together and discuss things and agree things. But then I think it can also have the subsequent effect that countries wait for it um, and all the good narratives come out during COP. And it's like, well, you can just reduce your emissions the rest of the time. There's nothing that says you have to wait for a COP to just start reducing your emissions. Um, And I think particularly with these recent ones, we've seen them saying, you know, we must stay below 1.5 degrees and then they get home and they open a coal mine. Um, So it's, it can be difficult in that sense because there's this one point in time where everybody talks about it and the rest of the time it's kind of forgotten about. But it can be useful for an activist perspective as well. because this is one time where activists from all over the world come together and meet and talk and share resources, share experiences. And for me, I've attended two COPs now. That was an invaluable experience that you can't get from anything else. Um, And I think that's almost what keeps COPs going because there was a particularly horrendous COP in Copenhagen. It was horrible to activists, didn't produce anything good. And loads of activists just said, well, what's the point in this? We're not, we're not doing it anymore. And now we've just had the COP with the highest attendance ever. Um, so it's really come back because people realise they missed that kind of solidarity internationally. So thank you, Dylan Hamilton, for joining us today. Dylan is a contributor to The Oil Machine, which is now showing on the BBC iPlayer. You can also contact us about hosting a screening in your community for your organisation, your business, your campus or group, wherever you are, Find out more at theoilmachine.org.